Yeah. All right, well, welcome. So this is how I teach. This is our second one of the semester so far. We have with us Dr. Joyce Foley and Dr. Rick Hudson from that department. Oh, Dr. Joyce, education. Sorry, you did it. No, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> and welcome. Today they're going to be talking about um, tips and tricks for creating interactive online lectures. So any questions you have, please feel free to stop them. This is very informal. Um, welcome to online learning. We're officially now hey. online learning. Oh, yeah. great name yeah. change. So, yeah. welcome to our office. Many of you have been here before, but welcome officially to the new, <laughs> new <laughs> online learning. And without any further ado, I'll Okay, thank you, Larissa. You know how when you buy a ticket to go see some big headliner show, like if you buy a ticket to go see Blake Shelton, <laughs> the concert never starts with Blake Shelton, right? <laughs> you know, there's always some up-and-coming wannabe who plays first. Well, I'm that up-and-coming wannabe because the real show today is Dr. Rick Hudson, so that's why I'm going first because he's really the headline act. So um, what I'm going to talk about is just a little bit about one of the classes. I've gone through the online course development program twice, um, in part because I did two different classes, but in part because I needed a remedial session. It's like it didn't stick with me the first time. I needed my special ed colleagues to make accommodations for me and make it work for me. Um, but I have learned, thanks to Yuhan and Larissa and um, Laura Cole, I've learned so many tricks about making my online class more personal. I've been a teacher at USI a long time. I tell my undergrad students that I've been here longer than they have been alive. That's a long time. Um, but the thing that I really value about classroom teaching is the relationships I have with students and the relationships that they have with each other. And so my biggest concern about moving to online teaching was losing that, losing that personal piece. So I tried to figure out ways to do that. So my course, this is kind of just how my course is laid out, but um, I'm going to scroll down to the bottom to the very first thing that students saw the first time they logged on to the class. Hi students, I'm Dr. Scully. Welcome to Education 378 Literacy Method. I am so excited so, to be your instructor and to begin this education. Can you hear it okay? Can you unhear it? So it's a little goofy, it's one of these telegrammy things, but I wanted them to see that it was done, that picture was done inside my office. And so they at least get a feel for, I mean the meme kind of looks like me, sort of. Um, but they also get a feel that maybe I'm a little bit goofy or a little bit um, lighthearted about what we're going to do, that this is not just totally serious, that I'm some stuffy professor sitting al alone in an office somewhere. And then the modules are arranged into things for them to do. So let me show you kind of a way that I get them to interact with that very first week. So their to-do list of assignments always starts, or their, the module always opens up a to-do list of things for them to do. And I connect it with links, et cetera, et cetera. Well, the first thing they're going to do in this class is they're going to watch an introductory voice thread. And I, I'm pretty intentional in the voice thread about introducing myself to them. And I include pictures of my kids and Hello. my dog. And, well, and I just, I want them to see that I'm a real person. And I tell them these three different states are the states where I taught elementary school. So I just, I want to have like a real informal introduction of who I am and how I got to USI. And then I talk about how they can get a hold of me and you know, I want them to come and see me, et cetera, et cetera. These are the places where I went to college. And then I talk about how long I've been at USI. Well then, of course, on the very last slide, I talk about, well, during the thing, I talk about how they're gonna, uh, what they're gonna expect from the class and how they're gonna be involved. So in this last slide, um, it said, it's called reading. It's how, it's how people install new software into their brains, is what that little cartoon says. But the directions to the students tell that they have to make an audio comment 
and I only accept audio comments. And on the directions for all the, the voice thread thing, another thing that I require the students to do is they have to change, they have to put a profile shot in the picture. You know, the, the default on voice thread is that they have a little meme there, like a little, they look like Monopoly game pieces to me. Mm -hmm. And so I force them to put a profile picture. I haven't had anybody object thus far. I don't know if I can really force them to put a picture, but so far everybody, I've been teaching online a long time, everybody has followed that. And I, they can't have anybody else in the picture with them. It's just like a little face shot of themselves. And I think that helps. It helps me kind of recognize who they are. And I think it makes them, you know, at least look and see who their classmates are. So the directions on this tell them that they have to think of something that they've read recently that made them think or taught you something new. So when the students introduce themselves, they'll talk about that. And then back up to the direction stage. It tells them after step three was commenting on the voice thread, step four is to go back and I tell them about this this week, but it's really not due till next week because the ass this assignment is due on Monday night. So this step four in this parentheses, it says this assignment is not due until next Monday. A reminder will be sent. But I tell them up front, you're going to have to go back and listen to your classmates' comments. And I want you to find someone that you have something in common with. Either you know them from another class, you learn something new, like they learn something new, you know, some something where you connect with somebody. And so the next week, the next week along in module two, I have them interact with each other over email. And I don't have any way, real way of keeping track of who did it, who didn't do it. It's just kind of an honor system. You don't get points for doing it. I just invite the conversation between the two students. And then a uh, follow-up to that, getting acquainted, kind of thing is then they do an assignment one of their first assignments is it's called um, my literacy heritage and in this assignment they have to create a voice thread in which they look back at their own journey as to how they became um, readers and writers and After this, so this is in, this is like in week two, I think, that they do this assignment. After those assignments have all been submitted then, I assign them a partner and they have to reflect with each other. They have to watch each other's voice threads about their literacy heritage. And then they have to come up with some ways that our individual literacy heritage, heritages, <laughs> impact classroom teachers. You know, why does it matter for an elementary classroom teacher to consider the literacy journey of our students? So they talk to each other about that. How did your heritage shape who you are as a language learner and a language user? And then what are the implications for classroom teaching with that? So I try to, whenever possible, make some kind of connection between what we're learning about in theory what they've experienced personally, and then how can they connect that and share that with each other. And so I try to be intentional about making text to world connections, like where do you see this out in the world? Where does this matter? And text to self connections, how does this impact your life? How do you, you know, what can you learn from others from this experience? And then this is one other tip that I'd like to share today, which is this note that I make to myself. After I teach a module, I find out what went wrong or what went right. You know, I find out things that, oh, you know, do this differently. So I always make notes to myself. Actually, that should be modifications for fall 17, not 2016. But I didn't like how the directions worked out on the assignment. So I make these notes to myself that students can't see. You know, the item is not available to anybody but me. And then, you know, take off points of the voice thread that's not open in a new window. You know, things that were frustrating to me in the grading process or, you know, I thought the students didn't interpret the assignment the right way. So I always keep track. You know, I could write those notes any place, but I just put them inside these modules. So when I copy this course into my next course next semester, all of those notes come with it and they're not on some separate sheet of paper. Questions? <laughs>
Yes, ma'am. Yes, I'll keep it. Picha, kucha, whatever. Pecha kucha. I saw that down there on the list. Can you talk about that? Yes. That's the cool thing. Look. Um, a pecha kucha, and I actually I've modified it from how it used to be. Um, pecha kucha is, uh, do you know what a pecha kucha is? Okay, let me just kind of briefly tell everybody what it is. A pecha kucha is a 20 by 20 presentation, 20 PowerPoint slides, and you talk about each slide for exactly 20 seconds. It's a great way to have students summarize what they know, talk about a novel that they've read, share an experience, something, and you have to be so intentional to talk for 20 seconds. It's not 10 seconds, and it's not 40 seconds. You have to really pick and choose what you're gonna say. 20 slides for 20 seconds. The first time I did that assignment, I had the students do do it on PowerPoint and narrate the PowerPoint and then upload it to YouTube. In my face-to-face -face class, that worked great because I was there to help them troubleshoot. In my online class, that was too many technology steps. So the second time I did that assignment, I kept the 2020 format. And actually what they do in this assignment is they talk about, this is at the very end of the class, they talk about they do this like an interview for a teaching job. You're gonna interview with an elementary principal. You have 20 times 20 slides to tell this principal who you're gonna be as a literacy teacher. You know, pick grade. I wanna teach second grade. Okay, what's your second grade literacy classroom gonna look like? You have to talk about writing, reading, spelling, handwriting, all of those things you're gonna do in your classroom. So the second time I did it, the technology bogged us down too much. They're designed to go be given live, but I don't have time to do that in an online class or, you know, doesn't work in an online class. Um, so I just changed it to voice thread. So that, but they do 20 slides, they narrate each slide for 20 seconds, but I skipped the PowerPoint, yeah, YouTube, yeah, I'll put it on YouTube. It yeah, it works great on voice thread. It works great. Yeah, you're very welcome. Very welcome. And now for the headliner show. Let me tell you a little bit about this person who's going to speak to you next. You are not really only is, way not only is Dr. Rick Hudson the chair of the mathematics department here at USI. When Rick Hudson was a student here, he was the president of our student government association. Some of you don't even know that Rick was a student here. He was a student here. And not only was Rick just any old student here, he was my student. I had Rick in class back when he was an undergrad. And when Rick graduated, he's going to really kill me now. But when Rick graduated, you know, every year at commencement, they give the president's medal to one graduating senior. Guess who got it? Wow. Dr. Rick Hudson. It was bachelor's, it was bachelor's student, Rick Hudson. When he was a wee lad, right? Pardon me? He was just a wee lad. Just a wee lad. Just a, well, he was gigantically tall, but a wee lad. Yeah. Yeah. We knew he had a lot of potential, even way back then. What year was that, Rick? Oh, I've been here a long time by then. <laughs> All right, I gotta figure out how to get out of the viewers here. Oh, yeah. You know, all the way to yep. the bar, right? Yep. All right. I never log out, I just close out. <laughs> Is that it? Yep, it's Pinky. It's Pinky. <laughs> Uh-oh. Oh, I broke it. I'm go. <laughs> well, I had an excellent teacher. <laughs> I probably had you about 2000, or 1999, I would say. Oh, okay. Yeah, you weren't a senior when I had you. <laughs> So I, I owe all my teaching ability to. Oh yeah, no, <laughs> really to Kathy Rogers, <laughs> right? There, there were there were several influential people who. Have... This is what you get when you change uh, passwords. So I hope this doesn't go on forever and ever and ever today, but it probably will because you know what today is. Ah! <laughs> It's going to go on forever and ever. Was that the nerdiest thing that's going to happen today? Yeah. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
Okay. No. Okay. Oh, not bringing up anything. Oh. Hmm. My courses aren't here. Go to the upper right hand and then click on login. All the way to the top. Ooh, there oh, there you go. I don't know why. That's never happened to me before. Is it a different Good problem solving? I'm sure the needle's crashed. So let me say this to, to start with. Well, let me share a little bit about my course. So the course that I designed is teaching mathematics with technology. It's actually a graduate level course for students that are in the MSc with a focus in math teaching. So most of the students in the class are classroom teachers, either in high school, I've had community college instructors, I've had some of our USI faculty take this class, but by and large, there are people that are teaching math already. They're not undergrads. And the purpose of the course is really to help them to learn about new technology tools and some of the mathematics behind new technology tools. So there's kind of these dual goals that we're learning about the tools, we're learning about mathematics, and at the same time, we're learning how to teach with these tools. So there's sort of three goals, math goal, pedagogy goal, technology goal. And so those, that's kind of the emphasis of the course. Um, I have had, like, I have only taught the course one time online, and that was last fall. So I'm, I'm really a novice at this, and I, I look at Joyce's, and I'm, I see all these, it's, it's really pretty when I open mine up. Mine is not that pretty. <laughs> and then, I mean, that's part of my, my goal. By the time I roll this out the next time, I hope to make some aesthetic changes to it. For me, just getting the content up there for this first time, or it was hard enough, wasn't it? <laughs> So now that I have most of the content, it, it's it's not quite as uh, not quite as pretty. I I will say I've already made some changes, and this is the course shell that I'm using now. My original um, class had four modules. I, I've, I've designed it now to just have three modules because I felt like the last module was really short anyway. It was it was calculus, so I had calculus as that fourth module. I just joined the algebra and calculus together. So now I have three modules overall. Like Joyce, I have a, a welcome, welcome voice thread where I share a little information about myself and about the course. Hello, my name is Rick Henson, and I would welcome Math 6 Technology. So, like Joyce, I share, share things <laughs> about myself, but one of the things I also do in sharing about the syllabus and the design of the course is I share a little bit about the directions for the course. And so within my voice thread, for a lot of, of the more active, engaging type um, slides within the voice thread, I try to identify with one of these headers that, that allows them to know this is what I'm supposed to be doing when I encounter a slide. And so I, I created five, and not every slide throughout the, the voice threads always have one of these. The practice is typically after a video where I'm wanting them to practice with the technology, practice how to use the tool. Explore is usually a math problem, or maybe it's a data set that I want them to explore with the technology. And so that's, that's something I want them to do on their own. It's not taken for a grade, but it, it usually is a, a, maybe a five minute activity that I want them to, to do. <coughs> but think, exactly what it says, think about something. So reflect on your own time. Uh, usually it's a, it's a question that I've, I've, I've had that I want them to think about and, and uh, try to come up with their own answer to. The respond is where I want them to interact with one another. And so I will often give them a question or a prompt that I want them to respond to. We'll see some examples of that in it. And then the assign symbol is when I want them to stop the voice thread and do a problem in their assignment. And so I, I try to make it actually not just the assignment at the end of the lecture. You know, honestly, when we teach in the classroom, that's normal for me, right? I teach during the, the uh, class time and then you have an assignment afterwards. One of the things I've liked about teaching online is that I can sort of embed an assignment throughout. And so that's what I've done. In the middle of the voice thread, I may say, this is where I want you to complete problem number four from the assignment. 
and it, it allows them to practice right away. If they, they can uh, practice a skill that they just learned or a new investigation that I want them to, to explore throughout. And then I also have the continued sign when it boils over to a second page. So let me show you an example of a, of a week in my class. <coughs> if it goes back. While that's thinking, do you, are the modules all released at once or do you do one at a time and how long of a period of time? So my modules are all, all released um, a week at a time. So within each module, there are about four to five weeks. Oh, okay. And so they have a week's worth of work. Because most of my, my students are classroom teachers, mm -hmm. what I did was open it up on a Friday gave them a weekend, a week, and another weekend. And then there wasn't anything to do until Monday because I find that a lot of my students use the weekends as the time that they're working on. So that gives them two weekends for any particular assignment. It did at times cause some frustration from my end because I wanted to sometimes respond in week two to something that happened in the assignments from week one, but I had already released week two. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I tried to follow up with email whenever I did oh. that. Um, I wanted to build that in initially, and I, I thought initially I would do that, but it just became a nightmare to do that. And so I, I tried to do as many responses like that. Just to... So I'm gonna go to a, a week. So like I said, I have three modules. The first is an introduction and a geometry module. The second is algebra. Like I said, I added calculus to that. And then the third model, module is data analysis and probability. So I thought we'd look at a sample week from the data analysis module. So in a particular week, I've aligned this to a, a textbook series. The textbook series was created to be very interactive in the classroom. And so I had to really think about how do I modify this very interactive classroom curriculum to the online setting. So like in this, this week they did four, oh, that moved. Oh, got it moved. Uh, yeah. They did four sections and each section has a voice thread. And then chapter two really wasn't broken up into, into sections. It was just sort of one larger section. So it's all together. So let's take a look at a couple of these. And I, I can't open up everything because uh, I don't think this computer has my, my software that we use on it. But I can show you what one of the voice threads looks like. Each chapter I open up with a sort of an inter introduction. So this wasn't the beginning of this chapter. I'd started the chapter the week before. So there's not an introduction. But you can see it, in some cases I just have a reading. And, and so there's no. No symbol up in the corner, but oops. In some cases, I use videos. That's okay. You probably can't hear it that well. But what I'm doing is describing, it's a program called Tinker Plots that is used in, by some math teachers in schools to teach about data analysis and statistics. So I go through how do you create a video or how do you create a, um, a graph in this case. So they're creating dot plots. So I use a program called Screencast-O-Matic. And I'll show you how to do that in a minute here. But it's an online free tool that I found really helpful to record things that I want to show on a computer. And if you notice, as I move the mouse and click, it has a yellow circle that moves with my, my arrow on my mouse. And when you click, it turns blue and kind of explodes in a way so you can see it. 
I'll go to my overview here. So after that, I guess I could have gone on. After that, then they have a practice. So during this practice slide, I want them to take the steps they just saw, work on their own computer to, to create a similar graph to what, what we just showed in the video. Can there may be readings? Here's an example of an explore. So they have a data set that they're working with. I want them to create box plots for each of them and examine the distributions. For each one, I want them to consider how they would describe the center of the data. So pointing them to, to explore an activity on their own, a data set in this case. Oh, and throughout, this was actually something that an idea I took from the book, the curriculum that I use, they had a number of tech tips. And so throughout, I tried to uh, include those. So yeah, this one, this had a lot of reading. Not all of them have, have reading. So then in this case, I, I give a discussion prompt. So I ask them to discuss two different methods that are being used to find, find the quartiles of the data set. And I want them to compare and contrast. So you can see different students have responded. It makes sense less. What is that try to get to understand? that different researchers or statisticians will do things differently. Meaning some students chose to do an audio recording like this. Uh, occasionally they did a video recording and some students preferred to type out responses. So this is where I need help because one of the frustrating things that I had in the course was the first student that responded would make a response because they were prompted to do so. The last student that made the response listened to all the other students first and then had a, had a, had their response. And so I, I was frustrated throughout this semester. And this is where I'm going to make some changes for the next time I teach the course. And I would appreciate any feedback I'll have here online teaching experience. So how do I get that first student to listen to the others? And how do you get it so that the last student, they, they almost feel like they have nothing left to say at times. I even had some students say, oh my gosh, I listened to the other 11 students because I only had 12 students in this class. They would say, after 11 students, I really had nothing to say. So any advice? I'd be welcome to hear your thoughts. Not yet. Because yeah. there is an option on Blackboard discussion board, but they have to make their they can't see it until they that's all. You can ask them to go find go discuss. I wonder, I, this might be more trouble than it's worth, it might not be effective, but okay, this is week one, you're in the first half of the alphabet, you need to post before Wednesday, and if you're in the second half of the alphabet, you post from Thursday to Saturday, and then next week, flip-flop, I don't know, I mean, it just might, it, then, it still doesn't put the last person first, mm -hmm. but at least it would force some people to be in the first half of the responses and some people to be in the last half. Because I find that it's the same student who always is first. That's right. And it's the same student who's always last. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> well, and one of the students that, that was at the end told me about how frustrated she would be because she didn't feel like she had anything new to contribute. I think one of the things I've thought about next time <laughs> <Go first. laughs> is setting it up so I had kind of created this so that every time they had a response, they had to respond. And I think I'm going to set that up next time, that they don't always have to respond every single time. Uh, you know, that they may only have to respond two or three times per week, and one of them has to be a reaction to some things. I was actually pretty impressed with how many of them would bring up in their discussions something someone else had said, something they appreciated about a comment that someone else said, or 
something they, they disagreed with. I was actually very impressed with how, how well they did that. Another thing you can do, and again, I don't know how much work this is, moderate comments, and you have the ability as an instructor to make those public. Like there's a little eye button that you click on to let others do it. So that way you could see who everyone else sees. So I, that's just an idea. That way I know if they, they actually listen to mm -hmm. Because you as an instructor can select who everyone else can see. They still have to do the assignment. You can still grade it the same. So you can just select a little eye button. There's like an eye that's closed and an eye that's open. You just select on that to have everyone do it too. But again, it moderate comments that you get an email every time someone makes a response. So you yeah. <laughs> know laugh that well want to do. Yeah. Is that my well the handful it work? <laughs> I will say like there were you talked about grading, and I did grade grade these responses. I just had a three point scale though. They either got two points, one point, or zero points. So I, I didn't want to spend all my time grading these. And I mean, so I had a pretty simplistic uh, grading structure. And usually, most students that, that made a good point usually got two points. Um, I did assign one point in some cases where the student was very reflective, very thoughtful. So going on, you know, another exploration where they're, they're looking at another data set, creating um, another screencast. They practice, I'll eventually get to. So then here's an example of an assignment. So this is near the, near the end of this section. I want them to go now to assignment number eight, the item number four. So it kind of prompts them to throughout to do assignments. I also have other examples in week 12, like in this chapter I mentioned it was a single, single section. One of the things that I liked about this, you can kind of see the overview here that I did have some practices and some responses. We had an actual video of students, two students in this case, who are using, the whole video is about, well, over 17 minutes long. But to give you a sense, it goes through sort of the beginning of the lesson, what the teacher in this case did to introduce the activity. And then it actually shows video of two students. So you have the view of the student here, but they're actually using the software. So in this case, these teachers that are in my class actually get a chance to see what was it like in a real classroom when kids were using the software. And so we had enough a, a response where they got to choose um, from three questions to answer, and they responded to one of the three after video. Did you do all that closed captioning on those videos? No, that's, that was the great thing about the curriculum series that they had some of the videos already. And so I, I didn't have to do all that. Very good. <laughs> so I don't know if anyone's interested, but I, oh, wait, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. What did I do wrong? Just click X. Uh, click on share screen. Yeah. So I mentioned I use this screencast matic for a lot of the videos I created, ones that I did myself. A lot of the ones with the students were part of the uh, part of the curriculum series. But I also created quite a few on my own. It's really easy to do. I don't know if any of you are introducing any technology tools in your in the classes that you teach. But all you do is hit start recording. And usually it doesn't take this long. Oh, I have to download something. I'm sorry. Usually all you have to do is hit start recording and it brings up another screen. 
and then you can bring up whatever it is you're doing. You adjust the size of your screen to your window that you want to show, you want to record. Very easy to use. At the end, you hit stop. Takes it just a minute to, to download, and then you have options. What I typically do is download to YouTube, but I make it a uh, non-public, so you have to have the link in order to, to access it. So I didn't put mine out for everybody to see. That way, it's open for students to use. Um, so yeah, that, that was nice whenever I could embed those in VoiceThread. One of the activities I actually did in the class is that I, my students had to learn how to use screencasts and create a screencast of their own, where they introduced a new tool to the class. And I, I, my students told me at the end of the class it was one of the most beneficial things they did because they learned about new technology for their class, but many of them had never created a screencast themselves. I'm, I'm back in my old <coughs> site. That's a, that way you can see their work. So they, they use Screencast-O-Matic to create their own screencast, and they introduced sometimes websites, sometimes it was new technology tools. That, and in, in some cases, this teacher actually implemented it with her class, so she talks about what she did in the class. She went beyond what the minimal expectations were. Uh, but it was a good activity, I think, for these students in this, this class that's focused both on technology and teaching with technology. It was good for those students. So, questions? Can you edit videos? And um, I think with the pro version. So you can pay $15 a year for a pro version. I haven't done that. So I, I just have the free version. I, I don't know that much about the free version, so I'm not sure. Sorry, I don't. Well, thank you very much.